during the break about all the things we knew about software development all the way back from the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and why is it that we never paid attention to all the data that we had? For example, uh, when was the IBM 360 project? In the 1960s. Fred Brooks led it. He wrote, wrote a book called The Mythical Man Month. And in there he, said, he articulated Brooks' Law. And Brooks' Law said you add more people to a late project and it gets later. And basically the fundamental dynamic is as project size gets bigger, the productivity per developer goes down. The other thing we have lots of data on now is that as, you, as projects become late and you put people under pressure and they start to work more hours, then uh, they start to build in more defects, they lose creativity, and all of a sudden it costs more it's slower. They work more hours and they actually slow down by working more hours. You can actually measure that happening. So clearly software is a hard problem. It doesn't scale the way we've thought about it. What are some of the other hard problems? There's a law called Ziff's Law that says software is unpredictable. Uh, because uh, the surveys show that over half, some people say more than 80% today, of requirements change while you're developing the software. But traditionally we have this idea that we have to build this big plan up front before we start, right? To get, get the customer to buy the project, we have to have the big plan and the money and the time and then they pay. But then 80% of that plan changes. So 80% of the cost of developing the plan was complete waste. And even worse, in order to avoid scope creep from changes, we set up change control boards that try to prevent the change. And then we deliver the project at the end with the original requirements and the customer says, that's not what we wanted. And this is causing companies to go out of business, big companies. For example, I worked with Bell South in Atlanta, and they, had, they were the biggest part of AT&T when it broke up. They had some of the best engineers out of Bell Labs. They could deliver a perfect project every time, on budget, on features, on time. Their projects were usually about two years, 10 to $20 million projects. And when they invited me down to Atlanta, I said, well, why, why are you talking to me? You can deliver a perfect waterfall project every time. They said, the customers are saying, we don't want what you delivered. And when we say that you, you signed up on that for that two years ago, here's your signature on the specification. The customer is saying, well, our business requirements changed. Or we didn't really know what we wanted. And they said, it used to not be so much of a problem, but now some of the customers are refusing to pay. And I said, how often do you have this problem? They said, 100% they said, of the time, on every project. <laughs> I said, what? You, you deliver a perfect project 100% of the time, and 100% of the time the customers don't like it, and many of them are refusing to pay. I said, you're going to you're going to go out of business if you don't if you don't stop doing that. Has anybody tried to Google Bell South lately? <laughs> it only took them about a year to disappear. It's too late. When that problem is happening 100% of the time, game over. Now, when we discuss this problem with process experts, uh, back in the early days when we were thinking about Scrum, we talked, we were told the leading process experts in the world were at DuPont Chemical Corporation. And they were hired by DuPont to stop the chemical plants from exploding. 
after Bhopal. So Ken Schwaber, my partner, went down and talked with them. And they said, well, you know, what we found when we came into the chemical industry, we found they had two, times of pro two types of processes. They had what we call predictive processes. You could run them like an assembly line. You, every step of the way, you knew what was going to happen, very little deviation. And for that, you want a predictive control system. But there are other problems in a chemical plant where you put chemicals in a vat, the vat bubbles and boils, and if you don't watch that vat, the whole chemical plant could blow up. So you need a different control system. They said an empirical control system. In every case of an exploding chemical plant, they found that somebody had applied a predictive control system to an empirical process. Now they asked us, what is the waterfall traditional project management? What kind of control system is that? It's a predictive control system. What kind of process is software development with 65% of the requirements change? <laughs> it's an empirical process. Therefore, projects explode. How many explode? If it's over 80, if it's over 2 million euro, the number is 82% of projects explode. Half of those are complete failures, 40% or so. The other 40% are over budget. Like the CIO of O2 in Germany asked me recently, he said, you know, my problem is I just finished another 100 million euro project. It cost me 270 million euro, and it was two weeks late. Can Scrum fix that? Two years, two years. Two years late. Two weeks. I'm sorry, two years late. And the answer is Scrum is designed to fix that. Now, what are the, some of the other fundamentals of laws of software? There's a law called Humphrey's Law. Has anybody heard of Humphrey's Law? It says the user never knows what they want until they see working software. So the only way to find out what they want is to actually produce some working software, give it to them, and see if they like it. And then they're not going to like it, and then you, then you keep on fixing it until they do like it. So all of this we knew even back in the late 1950s. Some of the biggest IBM projects in the late 50s were done with iterative development. So I came out of a background that wasn't software. I was a fighter pilot for 11 years. And uh, I flew 100 missions over North Vietnam. And the interesting thing about North Vietnam, it was the most heavily defended airspace in the history of aerial warfare. So as soon as you cross the border, you were being shot at by, with everything. Anti-aircraft, SAM missiles, you name it. Whatever they had, they were shooting it at you. And it was all the latest equipment from the Russians and the Chinese. They were testing out everything. And so half the people I flew with got shot down. So my strategy was as soon as I crossed the border, I went into an evasive maneuver because a lot of the a lot of what they were shooting at you, you couldn't see in the daytime. At nighttime, you could see the tracers, but in the daytime, you couldn't see it. So you had to assume that if you weren't evading, you were going to, a bullet was going to hit you. And during that evasive maneuver, I would wind up over the target at the right time. I was in reconnaissance, so I had to take a picture of the target. And uh, a lot of the guys didn't do that evasiveness, and they're, they're still dead and buried in North Vietnam someplace. Okay? So I came back and I, and, uh, uh, years after, was asked to come into a big bank to help with software projects. Uh, because I was an expert in certain technologies that I, I spent 11 years in the medical school as a medical school professor. And, to do the mathematical modeling, the kind of supercomputer mathematical we were doing of the human cell, we were using technologies that were very interesting to big banks. So they asked me to come take a look at, at the bank, and uh, uh, the particular bank was running 150 banks all over North America, so a big operation. They said, come on in. Uh, you know, At the medical school, you guys have all the knowledge and no money, but over at the bank, we have all the money, but we don't know what we're doing. So 
be perfect, perfect marriage. And, and that, then they made an offer that my wife couldn't refuse, and I wound up at the bank. <laughs> So here I am, I'm a fighter pilot and a medical professor, and I look at what these guys are doing. Hundreds of COBOL programmers were building banking software, just like in Zurich. Anybody in the banks in here? Yeah. You got that? Do you have COBOL, still have COBOL programmers? Yeah. I noticed their project were always, were always late. Are, are your projects late too? I'm a very old project. Yeah. Well, ours were always late, and when they were late, the management would get really upset, because sometimes they would be fired if the projects were late. And they would put pressure on the developers. They make them work late, they make them work nights, make them work weekends. They'd send them on death marches. I heard today that you can actually do that at Zurich. They send, they send people on death marches in Zurich here. Maybe not in your bank, but there's some banks here where they're doing this. But no matter how much pressure they put on the developers, they were always later, not earlier. Now, I looked at that coming from the medical school background and looking at project development as a system. And I realized it was in a, this lateness and this pressure was a stable state of a system. And everything that management was doing was keeping it stuck in this very unpleasant, stable state. And so I thought about that and I said, you know, what we really want is, is a state where projects are always early, developers are always having fun, managers are always getting their bonuses, customers are always excited about the product and happy. So what would it put take to take that system and move it to that state and could you create a stable state where that was true. Well, the first thing we had to do is we had really good data out of Bell Labs. And it showed that hundreds of companies, every dot is a company, and it showed that productivity depended on communications, the communication interactions on the team was the driver of productivity. And Bell Labs had came up, come up with a measurement called communication saturation. They could actually measure the, the, the communication in the team. And if, if that was at 100%, everybody knew everything they needed to know all the time. But they saw that actually it looked more like this. Most of the companies were in this range where communication with saturation was 20%. And they saw that was because, you know, this is about, they saw that the number of specialized roles in the organization was what determine communication saturation. The curve looked like this. So around 30, 27 to 30 roles was kind of the sweet spot for most of the companies, and that was 20%. And in this point, if you look at, for example, Microsoft Windows, they were getting two function points per developer month, or about 1,000 lines of C++ code per year per developer. But they had a data point over here, where it, well, actually up here it was about 80 to 90 percent was the highest data point. And they were getting 104 function points per developer month, or about 1,000 lines of C++ code per week per developer. So. Eight people on this team were worth 400 people at Microsoft. Now, because of that, Mike, uh, Bell Labs uh, completely eliminated titles on the team. They said everybody is going to be a member of technical staff. 
So when I was hired into a company to build tools for our big customers and the tools were building object-oriented systems and they needed a process to go with them, the first thing I said is we got to do exactly what Bell Labs do, did. We got to get rid of all titles. So I said to all the developers, take all your business cards and throw them in the wastebasket. We're only going to have members of technical staff. And then they said, well, what are we going to put on our resume? How are we going to get another job? What are, what are we going to talk to the customers about? So I said, make up whatever business card you want as long as the team agrees that it reflects what you're doing and you can put it on your resume and show it to the customers. Just don't bring it to work. And they, could, they found they could ha have much more creative titles than human resources had come, come up with. So it actually played to their benefit. They could get better jobs with their better titles. <laughs> Out the middle management like leaders or... I've been fortunate that I've always been hired in as, as a CTO, vice president of engineering, whatever. So if management hires that, me in, I say, this is the way it's going to be. And it, if it's not that way, fire me because I'm not, I'm, I know what the data is at Bell Labs. And, and we're not going to have this mess that you have in your other teams. Otherwise, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. So let, let me rephrase. How many of the middle management left the day you came and made them out? In this particular setting, uh, in the first scrum team, the CEO asked me to come in to launch a new technology. And he said, Jeff, we have, we have 10 people that can be VP of engineering. So, but we, we don't have anybody that can actually, we need a, a new product set for this whole company, and it needs to be done in six months. We just bought a new compiler company that has the underpinnings, the, the, the base tooling, but a whole new set of products need to be built on top of that. We need a, you, we'd like you to come in and take our best people and deliver that product. The company will do whatever. It was like I was a chief engineer at Toyota or something. The company will do whatever it takes to make that happen. So I, I had complete free reign. Now, I have to say in a later company where I had about 600 developers, I went in and I said, we're all going to Scrum. And I got all the managers together. It was a group at least as big as this. And I said, we're all going to Scrum. So the first thing we need to do is take all our business cards and throw them in the wastebasket. Now, all you managers now, forget about that. It's over. We're going to have teams, and we're going to have team leaders. You're going to be on a team, and you're going to be a team leader. I want, we're going to spend a whole day on this, and we're going to figure out what are the teams in this company, which team are you on, and which team are you leading. By the end of the day, we had that structure, and we started. Two weeks later, the most senior guy, a vice president who thought he should have had my job, <laughs> came to me and he said, Jeff, he, was, he, had, he owned our biggest site in Boston, hundreds of developers. He came to me and said, Jeff, you know, back three weeks ago when I was a manager, I had time to do all this budgeting and performance appraisals and paperwork, but now that I'm a leader, of all these teams, I had to spend all my time out there in front of the people, you know, setting the vision, guiding the way, you know, getting them on board. I have no time for all this paperwork anymore. And I said, well, who was leading the people back when you were a manager? And he said, I don't know, I guess nobody. I said, well, thank God we finally have a leader. <laughs> we'll get you some help with the budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was the difference. Managers become leaders in a scrum company. So now that we had no roles, we went to work and we started, in addition to building the product, we started to review the entire literature on project management, productivity, hundreds of papers. I knew we were going to have at least a thousand documents that we had carefully studied before we could take it to the next level. On about the 300 paper, we, met, we read a paper by two Japanese Harvard Business School professors. And they had looked the best project teams in the world at companies like Honda, <clears throat> Fuji Xerox, 3M, not software, 
all building products, consumer products, cars. And they noticed that the best teams in the world all look to them like rugby teams, and particularly the scrum formation in rugby. And they described how it worked. They were all doing everything all together, a little bit of requirements and testing and documentation and implementation. And the goal would be, let's get a new prototype of a car that works in 90 days, because everybody has to do everything. And they called that style of project management, they said, scrum. Now, our team wanted a formal model, you know, that was based on best management theory uh, to build what we were building. And we looked at that and we said, that is exactly it. And so the whole team said, OK, we're going to form as a scrum team. And they said, OK, what will we call the team leader? And the, and the team decided we'll call him the scrum master. So now we had a team and a scrum master. What's that? It was Yes. You know, it was basically, I was guiding this whole thing. I was as a chief engineer. I had the final decision on everything, but I involved the team in everything. So it was a collaborative effort. So now we had the team and we had a scrum master. And we went to work. We knew we wanted to do things in short cycles. Uh, the first cycle, which we began to call sprints, that's again, that, that's, the team came up with that idea, was a month long. We knew it had to be a month or less. And so we started sprinting. And at the end of the first month, we had a demo we knew uh, we uh, we implemented a process or or a practice out of the MIT Media Lab because I had run a company on the MIT campus and hired many people out of the Media Lab and they had a practice called demo or die. Every three weeks you had to demo really cool stuff or they killed your project. So I said, we need that here. I know how it works. These guys are really good. It will help us a lot. So at the end of the first month, we had a demo, and it crashed. Now, we fixed it, and we actually then deployed it to consultants, because even the first month, the tooling did a lot of code generation that was helpful to our consulting practice. And so they were more than interested in actually testing it out on, world, on real projects. So I said to the team, you know, we need practice demos. So let's do a demo every Friday. I'll invite some of my engineering friends from companies in the area, some experts in you know, development, coding, testing. They'll come in and we'll have a lunch, Friday you know, brown bag lunch, and you could do a demo for them just to practice. So the first Friday, they did the demo, and it crashed again. And they were so embarrassed. I knew if they did this in front of their peers and they had bugs, that they would be so embarrassed that that would never happen again. So the next Friday, sure enough, they come in. It works perfectly. But then the guys from the other companies look at what they've built, and they've said, haven't you looked at how Microsoft does that or how Borland does that? The way you implemented that, it really looks bad. In fact, it sucks. And at the end of that demo, when our, our engineer friends left, they all put their heads on the table and they said, we don't know if we can do any more demos. It's too hard <laughs> and too painful. And I said to them, you know, you can be just another development team, always being late, always having software that's not good enough, always never having enough software, always under pressure. Or you could be a great team. But to be a great team, you're going to have to hear the feedback from the great people that build good product. So which is it? And they thought for a bit and they said, we'll do one more demo. <laughs> good thing they decided that. <laughs> now in the meantime, we had read this paper and we realized, and this, this was the second month, uh, February 1994, we read this paper, 
and we realized that this Borland team, the reason it was so fast and the reason communication saturation was so high was because of a daily meeting. And we said, we really need to have a daily meeting to get really high performance. And so in the second sprint, we implemented a daily meeting. You know, we already had, you know, the daily meeting we implemented, we already had a sprint review. And the first sprint review included a retrospective. It wasn't a separate meeting yet. We already had a sprint planning meeting to plan for the sprint. But we introduced this daily meeting. And at Borland, it was usually at least an hour. And we didn't like that. We thought it took too much time. We kept on getting it shorter and shorter until we had it where it is today, 15 minutes. And we knew the information that needed to be shared to produce performance. Uh, we kind of got that working by the end of the second sprint. Pretty good demo at the end of the second sprint. We started into the third sprint. We planned a normal months of work. And we were done in a week. And everybody said, what happened? And it was all driven by this daily meeting. And, and what happened in the daily meetings is that people would say, I'm going to work on this task. And the team would say, now wait a minute. You know, for the team to go fast, you need to work on something else. That's going to slow you down. That's going to slow the team down. Might be good for you, but not for the team. And so the developer would say, well, OK, I'll work with this and try to get this story done. It'll help the team get done faster. And then the team would say, well, how are you going to do it? And the developer would explain how he was going to do it. And one of the team members would say, well, I've already implemented a lot of that, the code I'm working on. Let's pair after this meeting, and instead of taking two days, we'll get it done in an hour. So all these two-day tasks were collapsing into an hour's work, and were done in a week. We had gone hyperproductive. We were at 400% of the previous month. Now, as soon as that happened, I knew we had four months to deliver, we're a week into the fourth month. Now, instead of having, you know, a little over three months of work left, I knew we could do the same amount of work in a week. I had 12, 13, 14 weeks. I had 14 equivalent sprints left of features that I could ship. And I said, we need to get somebody out of product marketing and get him out in the market really fast to figure out what's the competition doing, what do the customers want, how are we going to order that feature list, because I don't have enough time to be out there at least half my time, and the other half of my time to be explaining to you guys exactly what the customers are saying. So I went to, the, I went to product marketing, I said to the VP of marketing, I need your best guy, I know who he is, Don Roeder, give him to me. I want him to be what is now known as the product owner for Scrum. He is going to own the backlog. And I said, Don, you have the business plan for this product. I want to know how much revenue it's going to generate. I want you to know what features are going to generate that revenue. When it hits the market, I want Computer World, PC Week, all the IT magazines to say, this is the best product they've ever seen in this market space. And Don proceeded to do that, and he was successful. So we then had the three roles that we have in Scrum today. And we had the three meetings that are part of Scrum today. Now, this is actually split into two meetings. It's also really important in Scrum today to do some product grooming, getting the product backlog ready before you go into sprint planning. At the same time we were doing all this, we went after the reporting. <clears throat> because at the beginning of this project, I talked to the CEO of the company and I said, 
you expect a new product set at six months, and I bet you expect a plan for me right now. He said, yes, I do. And I said, I bet you expect a, expect a Gantt chart. He said, yes. I said, how many Gantt charts have you seen that have been correct? And he said, in 25 years of software development, I've never seen a Gantt chart that's correct. <laughs> and I said, well, I'd be really stupid to give you another wrong Gantt chart, wouldn't I? And he said, well, what are you going to give me? And I said, how about if I give you working software at the end of every sprint? You'll be able to sit down and use the product, try it out, and you can validate for yourself every step of the way how far we are. And he said, well, that would certainly be better than a wrong Gantt chart. <clears throat> and I said, well, in return for that, I need you not to bother the team during the sprint. And he was a guy that liked to run in and mess with the team. And he looked unhappy with that. <clears throat> and I said, you know, if you do that, we'll never beat this six-month target. But I said, at the end of every month, when you look at that software, you can change everything if you want at Sprint Boundaries. And he thought about that for a minute, and he said, OK, let's do that. So off we went on implementing Scrum. So I was giving him working software, but to get that working software, I had a product backlog that was owned by the product owner. At the sprint planning meeting, we would break out a sprint backlog. And then I needed a measure. So these were our artifacts. I needed a measure of how well the sprint was working. Now, because of my fighter pilot background, I noticed that on these big projects that I'd work with, people had a lot of trouble landing, on a, a, a landing a project on target. They would always overshoot. And it reminded me of, of training new fighter pilots. They'd come around trying to land that fighter aircraft, and all of a sudden, they'd be high on the glide path. And all of it, they'd be wanting to land the plane halfway down the runway. And if it was wet or icy, you could slide right off the end of the runway. And it, that happened to me twice in an F-4. Fortunately, I had a tail hook, and I caught a chain at the end of the runway both times. Otherwise, I would have been into the water, into the trees, into the buildings. It's always bad at the end of the runway. So I thought about, OK, what do you need to land an airplane? Well, you need to know its airspeed. You need to know its altitude. You need to know its rate of descent. You need to know the angle of attack, because as you're slowing down coming in for a landing, you're pulling that nose up, and you create a lot of drag. And at a certain point, it takes more power to go slower. And the, the same thing is true of software projects. So you have to really watch that angle of attack. You might have a crosswind. You know, things trying to interfere. So you, you have to really understand the, the, you know, the heading that you're pointing on that aircraft. So that's at least five things that all have to be adjusted every second as you're going down that glide path. So I said to the team, you know, you need to see the glide path. You need to know how high you are off the end of the runway, how fast you're going, what your rate of descent is, what your direction is, that's the product backlog. All of these things in order to nail that. And we're going to get rid of every other reporting. And we're going to make this visible to everybody so anybody wants to see the state of the project, they can walk by the board and they can see all this then we never have to waste our time in any more reports, because the reports have always been wrong anyway, bad Gantt charts. Now people can come and look at the real deal, the real thing, to see the real state. And that became Scrum as we know it today. Why did you choose the word backlog, or product backlog, or I'm trying to remember why that. 
that just sort of appeared. It was kind of the backlog of work we had to do, stuff that was stacked up that we needed to, to do. And, and oftentimes the, uh, the discomfort with the word is that it implies that we're starting from a negative state as opposed to we could be starting something totally new and don't really have a stacked up. Old well, here's another thing that we made a decision very early on, is that in Scrum we never start anything new. If we have something new, we take a, a one-week sprint and we create a piece of code that's old. Then we enhance it. Everything is maintenance. So we said, we're not going to have this thing where other people maintain stuff. You put it out there and then other people have to deal with all the dirty laundry, that just encourages the developers to put bad code out there. You know, wanted the developers to eat their own dog food. They put bad dog food out there, then they have to eat their own dog food. So every, and we didn't want maintenance programmers to be different than new development. So everything is maintenance. Everybody has the same job title and everybody's doing maintenance. Now the focus is on not you, but the team being great. And when the team is great, it's just like a sports team. If you're on one of those great teams, you never forget it. When this, when this team was acquired and the company was moving, some of our, about half of our staff did not want to move. And they were in my office crying, saying, I'll be searching for a team like this for the rest of my life. I'm concerned that I never will find it again. Boo hoo 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 hoo, tears all over my desk. <laughs> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> but today, Scrum is everywhere. So we've solved that problem. Thanks a lot, Jeff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Since you guys probably have a question or two, uh, we'd like to write down a few questions. I'll do five minutes of taking over questions, then we'll prioritize them and look which questions are the most important ones. So it's not just the guy who shouts the loudest who gets to ask questions. And um, yep, the five minutes start. So hit me with questions you want to ask. Okay. Yeah. I sometimes have the feeling that Scrum has an inherent perspective 
of a big company having a, a certain uh, team of developers which are already in the company and that are working month by month and everybody is working there on a steady basis. But how can you use that approach if you like have to, to win a big project like Somebody uh, asking a fixed price project, a fixed price project, but, but a, of a real uh, larger size. Then. Okay. Yeah. How does it change the uh, evaluation process? Yeah. yeah. That's yes. Just, if you yeah. like, have no, we've been talking about your story points. If you didn't have no calibration, no experience, because yeah. you have this. I'm just about a fixed price project. Okay. Is that clear enough? This is a favorite question anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How do you uh, organize support? From? How do I organize support? what? Support, okay. How to do support? Organize, okay. <coughs> mm -hmm. How do you use from the regulated? environment like ROC, um, FDA, uh, target, yeah. so FDA, or just like FDA, okay, so say it's that's documentation hell, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. What do you there? The dependency between stories, where usually you would write big specification. Okay, dependency between stories. Actually, I think we're close to having enough questions. <coughs> One more. Yeah? How do you work with uh, multiple projects or backlogs? Okay. So multiple projects, but maybe one backlog. Multiple, multiple backlog. projects, but one, one, one team. Yeah, multiple projects. Multiple projects. Multiple projects. Multiple projects. Multiple projects. Okay, now. Everybody has one vote. Means you can raise your hand once, only once. And I will keep track. So you are through. So choose wisely. So we have I'll quickly run through. We have multiple projects for one team. How clients, how do your clients support? Size and sprint, how do you determine the duration? Why are banks are nothing to change? Scrum with traffic light and safety uh, environments. Who is doing what? Like roles? Fixed price project. How to do Scrum with a support team? FDA and all the, the, the medical stuff um, and the process they put on you and dependency between stories. Okay. First one, I'll take the same order. How do you get clients on board? Who's going for that one? One, two, three, four. Okay. Size of sprint, how to determine the duration of a sprint? One, two, three, four weeks. Two. Why are banks reluctant to change? Especially to scrum. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Scrum with traffic lights and safety environments. I guess it's related to FDA. Right, so, so should we put those together? Yeah. Put those together, strong traffic lines and FDA. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Who is doing what? The role. How to find out what who gets what role? One, two, three, four, five, six. Fixed five projects. Probably get one voice, right? Everybody want to raise their hand once. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And how does this do support? Who's the strong or support team in strong? So you're sitting together there, right? One, two, three, four. Are you in the support team? Depend. See between stories. One. Are you asking a question? <laughs> Multiple projects and one team. One, two, three, four. 
Okay. So, the order is that we want to make the FDA and you can start with that, Jeff. FDA and like, in safety, I guess, with a lot of restrictions and process and documents you have to write and stuff like that. And we have a couple of sixes at roles and fixed price projects and a lot of banks are not to change. Try. Yeah, okay. We <clears throat> um, some years ago, I was CTO of what is now GE Healthcare, and some of our projects had to be FDA certified. And I had, everything had been converted to Scrum. So the first thing I said is, you're not going to insert FDA into the Scrum directly. We're going to take the FDA expert, and we're going to have that person work with the product owner. And they're going to put in the backlog what the requirements are for FDA and make that part of the definition of done at the end of the sprint. And the team will figure out how to, how to do that. What the team figured out is that they were building features every sprint and fully complete features, tested features, and so they really needed to only document those features that were built and tested for the FDA to give traceability for those features. And they were running six sprints for a new project, a new product, and uh, so they only needed to do a six of the work at the end of every sprint for documentation. And at the end of the six sprints, it was just like Toyota builds documentation for a new car. It incrementally grows until the car is ready and then it ships immediately at Toyota and so the documentation is accurate to the date that car shipped. Now I measured the cost of that and it cost us 5% of project cost in overhead for FDA documentation. And previous projects had cost at least twice as much. So we we'd eliminated 95% of the overhead of FDA. And we got true traceability. Now, I have consulted for big medical device companies who write 600-page specs. And I have told them, I said, your 600-page spec is not updated for all the changes that occur in the next year or two of development. I know that. You know that, right? Everybody shakes their head yes, <laughs> right? That means you are committing fraud. This is, you're potentially criminally liable. In the best case, you're posing a patient safety hazard by producing non-traceable documentation and telling the FDA it is. So if you're going to do software development like that today, I recommend you get a good lawyer. Because if you're sued and they come after me as an expert witness, you are going to lose big time. So today, I'm telling people it's criminal to do waterfall for medical devices. Criminal activity for which they could be sued for fraud and held liable for the death of patients. And if they want to do that, go ahead, but I don't want to have anything to do with them. I don't want to be stuck in a lawsuit. That's FDA certification. Now, railway. One of the most interesting projects in Europe was the Zebias doing the Netherlands railway scheduling system. <clears throat> scheduling systems for railroads are hard design-wise. It's complex. It's a complicated thing to do the scheduling. So they had hired <clears throat> multiple waterfall teams. They had spent over 8 million euro, and nothing worked. So they brought ZB in and did Scrum. And they did a very high-performing Scrum that was actually one of the first distributed Scrums where half of the teams were in India and half of the Netherlands. And uh, in, in a year or two, they delivered they completely new code. They delivered it complete for 2 million euro. And the quality was better. Their definition of done every sprint was the railroad ran it on their real servers, pre-production servers, 
declared that it passed all acceptance tests or they got no credit for anything. Okay. So in terms of speed and quality, it's one of the fastest and highest quality projects I've seen. And there, there's a paper written on it in IEEE Digital Library. So I, I'd pull that out and show it to the railroad. The other thing that was really important to me is I've trained the people that worked for Lockheed on the, the latest generation of fighters. And they were using Scrum to build all the software that runs the cockpit, the heads-up display. And so I was really interested from a fighter pilot's point of view because many pilots are killed because you know a switch is in the wrong place in the cockpit, something bad happens, and they make a mistake. And we had a rule of thumb. You had to kill five pilots before they would fix a switch. That's the way it worked. So I was really interested in, OK, how is the, the look and feel and the relationship with the pilot by doing Scrum for that software? They said, much better. You get a much better user experience with Scrum. The second thing that pilots are concerned about is defects. Incredibly less defects. You know, Microsoft is, for, for Microsoft developments tools, they've reduced the defects by 90% by using Scrum. For 3,000 people, defects are down 90%. So you get much higher quality, much better fit to the user experience with a, with a well-executed Scrum because you're constantly getting the end user feedback as you're building it. And if you're forcing a strong definition of done at the end of every sprint, you're getting much higher quality product. So, you know, in any mission critical thing, I think you'll get a better result with Scrum. Particularly if it has humans interacting with the product. It's, uh, yeah. Okay. So, roles. Who's doing what? How do you figure out who's doing the Scrum Master protocol team? I guess all the existing roles will they going to move into. Well, I mean, the first thing, the best thing to do always is to write a job description. What kind of a person do you want? <clears throat> and I think of the scrum master as kind of a cross between the soccer coach and the soccer team captain. So who do you want to be the soccer team captain? Somebody, you, experience. somebody that has experience, somebody that has the confidence of the team, somebody that will speak for the team, will watch out for the team. The team trusts them. Yeah. Yes. It's an emotional thing. Emotional thing. And then the coach part, you want somebody that's knowledgeable about the process. Can can help them, you know, execute the play well. So yeah, I mean you can write a job description for that. And then then you ought to post it and see who is interested. Uh, Typically, when you set up a team, like lots of times, you just pull a team together. You don't know who you don't know who's going to be the scrum master. You just say, okay, you know, who's the best fit for scrum master? Often, the team will know right away. Then you can try that. If it works well, fine. If it doesn't, try someone else. It is good to get someone that's a stable scrum master. It's like you know, if you're going into the World Cup, you don't want to change the captain of the soccer team. That could cause you the game, <laughs> cost you the game. So you have to watch about that. But you can do some experiment to get the right guy, just like you would do on a soccer team. The product owner is more challenging for people because that needs someone that knows the business domain and actually knows requirements and actually can work directly with the engineers and take their responsibility strategically and revenue-wise for the product. So that's a big job. And there are very few people that have a lot of experience with that today. But there are people that have relevant experience and who are interested in growing into that job. And so you really want to find someone like that. Now, it's interesting. In our, in our, I work with a venture capital group. We have 14 investments doing Scrum. And the investors have decided they like the Steve Jobs model of product owner. The CEO is the chief product owner. Now, the CEO doesn't have time to do all the work. So you have to build a team around the CEO that 
you know, comes up with the ideas, maybe comes up with some prototypes, maybe, and, and those ideas are bounced off. There's some great articles written on how Steve Jobs, particularly the iPad, how the iPad, uh, how the iPod was created. There's an article in Wired Magazine that shows exactly what happened, who they hired to build the prototypes, when they met with Jobs, what he said, how he selected what the iPod would be, what features he took off the iPod, all of that, and what, how, the, how the product team worked, worked with him as chief product owner to get that thing in place. Very fascinating. So our investors feel that if the CEO is not the chief product owner, they're at a competitive disadvantage in the market for software products. But they know they need to build a product team around the pro a CEO to do a lot of the work and get the backlog ready for the, for the team. So that's for a product company. For a consulting company, of which there are many more in Europe, very often when you go into an engagement, the engagement leader becomes the product owner. Because we find most of the time, even though we'd like the customer to be the product owner, they don't know enough about how to do requirements. There are political issues in prioritization they may not be able to deal with. And you as a consultancy have got to have a good backlog. You've got to have it prioritized. And you've got to have somebody own that and make decisions. And that's usually you as the consultant who's leading that project. So we see many people who have been project leaders and consultancies becoming the product owner, managing the customer, the backlog, and then bringing in scrum masters around teams to actually do the execution. That actually turns out to be a more powerful implementation form than the project leader, historical project leader style. It's a much weaker strategy to go in and engage that customer and deliver them because he gets the horsepower of those scrum masters behind him. Ah, that's a, that's a fun one. OK. <clears throat> First, you sit down with the customer. I, I talk to a lot of CIOs. And I say, well, how's it going for you? How are your projects going when you're outsourcing? You know, you're getting a, a, a third party vendor. You're doing fixed price projects. You know, are they all coming in on time and budget? The answer is always no. So then I ask them, well, requirements change, right? And they say, yeah. And I said, I bet the consultants charge you a lot of money when they change. In fact, at the, I was at the Pentagon recently briefing the nine task force that have been mandated by Congress to move everything to iterative incremental development. And I said to them, those Beltway bandits, their job is to bleed you dry with change requests. And every person in the room said, Yes. So then I say to the CIO, OK, a 5 million euro project, I bet it costs you 7 million. And they always say to me, no, not 7, 10. The average cost overrun is 100%. So then I say, well, you know, with an agile approach to the fixed price contract, we could give you all that change for free. We could, we could guarantee the 5 million euro project comes in at 5 million euro. Why would you ever go to with one of those waterfall consultants that are going to charge you for stuff you could get for free? And they always say, I wouldn't if I could find someone who would guarantee it would stay at 5 million euro. And so then I say, well, here's how it works. You know, in Scrum, we build a product backlog. And over time, we, we build the highest priority highest value things first, what we know is that 80% of the value is in 20% of the requirements. And we know that 65% of requirements are never or rarely used. That's, that's the worldwide average. And that gives us a lot of flexibility. The other thing we know in Scrum is that you can change the backlog anytime you want, as long as that's a sprint at a sprint boundary. 
So say as CIO, all of a sudden you've got this new thing that's top priority, and all of a sudden you want to insert it right here. All you have to do is go to the lowest of the low priorities that will never be used anyway and throw it away. <laughs> Equal amount of work. We're doing you a favor by getting you to throw away junk. And that gives you the change for free. I can tell you the buzz in Paris right now with the CIOs, they have no idea what Agile is, but they've heard you get change for free and they want it. <laughs> yeah. Crazy about free stuff, right? What's that? They are crazy about free stuff. Yeah, free stuff. They want free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But isn't that based on a, uh, quite some maturity in the customer's organization? You've been talking about the public sector. I've been doing a lot of projects with the public sector, with utility companies and stuff like that. And the problem there, from my point of view, is that people who are asking for the special uh, functionalities and stuff like that, they don't have any fees for it. They actually they don't give it that what it costs. And then it all adds up. And that's why companies run out of budget. The, I did a, I helped a consultancy with thousands of consultants do a marketing study. The CEO decided that this, along with what we call money for nothing, would be a strategic initiative that they would execute to, to disrupt the big Indian consulting houses. But before they could do it, they had to do a marketing study of how many clients could actually use this. And so we had... CIO dinners in New York and Boston. Not, no, I'm sorry, New York and London. And what we found was <clears throat> about a third of the CIOs were ready to act on this immediately. And these were people like Deutsche Bank, T-Mobile. Uh, a third of them wanted a sales call right away to talk about it. They wanted to understand it better. And about a third of them would like your client. They said, our organization is so screwed up, we could never execute this. But a third of the market ready to go this way is more than enough to be really successful. Actually, I'm still not convinced because I believe it's even worse. Uh, most CIOs kind of like start a project when they say we're going to do that, we will not implement any uh, functionalities that are not necessary and stuff like that. But then during the project, they don't have the, the, the power to stop all their uh, local uh, ideas there not to have them. Yeah. So that's the real, the real topic. Well, the last time I talked to the consultancy, they had executed about 20 of these. Um, on two of them, they had some problems, but that wasn't any worse than their waterfall projects. In both cases, the problem was bad estimation on their part or bad product backlog because they didn't have a good product owner. And they were providing the product owners. So in both cases, they felt that they had screwed up, that they were able to deal with the customer side of it. Now, it may have been that they carefully selected the customers because they said, you know, this is not for everybody. In fact, they charged a 30% premium over Waterfall to do these projects. Well, it kind of reminds me of all the SAP projects where the customer says, said at the very beginning, we are just a standard company. We will just implement the standard. We don't need anything else. Yeah. And what we ended up with was some totally new system that had nothing to do with SAP at all. Well, <clears throat> the way they protect themselves with this, they say, if you don't throw away as much as you add, it's time and materials just like we always did it. So they manage the risk that way. But I can tell you, there's a lot of CIOs out there that are hiring Accenture consultants by the hundreds. It looks great when they sign the contract. And then they get all these kids just out of school. They charge them big consulting dollars. They're really slow, and they're fed up. You can be on that one, that's for sure. OK. So they're like, what they do ask for, they say, we want a pilot, a short pilot, you know, two to three months, where we work with a team, we learn the estimation practice, we see the velocity of the team, and we feel comfortable that we're ready to pay for that velocity. And then we want to pay the velocity of that team. 
And if that team slows down, the vendor eats the cost. Now, a good vendor knows that in general, they will actually increase velocity as they learn more about the business. So unless they are really bad at executing, they'll actually make more money by increasing velocity. But you do have to be able to estimate. I mean, there's no magic in this. You have to be able to estimate. You have to get a backlog right. If you can't do that in Waterfall, then you're probably going to have trouble with Scrum. <laughs> I, I wasn't saying that it's going to be any better than Waterfall. What systematic engineer, software engineering in Denmark found is, as we talked about today, I think you were in the class today, right? Um, is that they can estimate five projects for the cost of estimating one in Waterfall because the agile techniques are so fast. They get as good or better estimates and they can actually implement, as we discussed today, at half the price of Waterfall. And this is a CMI Maturity Level 5 company that can do a perfect Waterfall. So it's, it's not a problem doing Waterfall. It's just they know what it costs to do both ways. And how does the evaluation process change? As a project, and says, OK, you want to do the project and evaluate the partner? From the customer's point of view, OK. For a customer to engage in a Scrum project, there are going to be certain requirements. Like the customer is going to have to work with the client to build the backlog. They're going to have to show up at every sprint review and look at the software and say whether they like it or not. If they're not willing to do that, then <coughs> nobody's going to execute a Scrum project with them because they know that that will cause problems. So systematic will revert to waterfall. You're clearly a waterfall client, and you will pay twice as much. It's still competitive with other waterfall vendors. We're still as, as same price or cheaper than the other vendors. It's just the waterfall price. If you want the scrum price, here's what you have to do, and it costs half as much. And you have 40% fewer bucks. It's your choice. The day, the day you stop following the requirements, it reverts to waterfall, and you pay twice as much. So they don't have any problems with the customers, or rarely have problems. I mean, the customer knows what they're, what they're signing up for, and they have to do certain things, and they do it to get half price. And they find that they get a much better fit by getting the customer involved like that. The customers are happier, and the developers like it better. The developers are happier. They get better re developer retention. So. Okay. Yeah, so that, uh, we could spend a whole day talking about fixed price projects, but we only have a few minutes. Do you have anything intelligent to say about banks are specifically reluctant to switch to Scrum? Well, I don't think bankers are any different than anybody else. They, nobody wants to change. Now, what I find with most of the companies I work with, particularly the larger ones, I usually get to work all the way from the senior management down to the engineering team. So I, 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 I'm engaged at all levels. And I typically find that if the management is engaged in wanting to go agile, the senior management has made a decision that to gain a competitive advantage, they need to be agile. Now, if that hasn't happened in your bank, then why try to implement Scrum? It's just going to be a big headache. If they don't want to get any better, they just want to do the same old thing, then the best thing to do is to go find a, another bank that gets agile. Because the other bank that gets agile is going to start taking market share away from that company that doesn't want to get agile. That's what's going to happen. And you don't want to be in a losing company anyway. Have you ever seen the process being implemented, uh, let's say, bottom up? Yeah, I mean, of course, that's where Scrum started. Everything was bottom up. So now. This is Gorilla Scrum. So now you've got to think differently. Okay. You're a guerrilla operation in hostile territory. So what you've got to go do is go in there, get Scrum going under the covers, you know, get a good high-spirited team, and every once in a while you pop up and deliver them great software, and then you die for cover before anybody realizes what's happened. 
And if you're good enough at that, over time, somebody gets attention at a high enough level and said, no, these guys are doing something over here that really works. And I can't get anything out of these water ball teams, you know. So then you've got a sponsor. So as we talked about today, what you want is a senior level sponsor. You want a godfather. Because once you have a godfather, nobody's going to mess with you. What happens if somebody messes with a godfather's team? Bad things happen. Now, then you can start planning a much wider implementation. The biggest problem is middle management. They're concerned about their departments, their job, their role. They don't have the incentive to change, even if the senior management is desperate to change. You know, the middle management is like, okay, what's my job going to be? Maybe we'll have less middle managers. They're very open about that at big European companies. <laughs> we don't want to change because there may be fewer management jobs. <laughs> Well, I tell them, well, maybe you'll be totally out of business. You know, tele the banks don't have so much of that problem, but the telecom companies, they could be bankrupt. A, a big telecom company can go under. I've worked with two really huge telecom companies that are gone. And so when I tell them that, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to be bankrupt like these other guys, and here, here they are, and here's what they did, and here's why they're dead, they believe me. And so the senior management is all in gear. The problem is the middle management is not so sure that their jobs are going to go away yet. So now you have to work with them. Say, OK, you've got to place your bet. For those people that will be flexible and lead change, there will always be a job. For those that won't be, you may be riding on the Titanic. You've got to place your bets. What's that? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the problem. The big banks in Zurich, the government's going to bail them out, right? They're, never, they're too big to fail like some of the ones in the U.S. But I can tell you there's a lot of politicians in the U.S. that are looking to cut banks down to a size where they can fail, just like Lehman Brothers. There's a lot of political people are really angry in the United States, really angry. They call them the banksters. <laughs> they stole a third of our retirement funds already, and they may go after the rest. That's the average American's point of view of a bank right now. We've got to do something about the banksters. So let's see if we can put that into political action. We'll see. It's very hard because there's a resolving door between the government and the banks. <coughs> For every congressman, there are five bank lobbyists. So if I'm a congressman, every day I've got five bankers at my door demanding I vote for their bill. That's how bad it is in the United States. But I can tell you, the American people are going to start demonstrating in the streets about this. All they have to do is foreclose on enough houses. So there's a little bit of fear in some of the banksters. Think that's a good word, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's some fear out there. And uh, feel free to ask Jeff for me or uh, a lot of questions if you like. Or we stay here for another half or an hour. We'll see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here.